enemy. It is a constant assault upon it. That was why, in the last time I was out here, I approached it first from this religious angle of Kierkegaard's and characterized the assault as one that caused despair, where despair was not a, a mood, but a structure that belongs to a captured garrison. Not an accidental feature of a captured garrison, but part of it, a structure of it, fundamental to it. And, and so now, I, I, the, the reason to use the Freudian text is to remind us that the kind of culture I'm talking about is simply to reverse that process that Freud saw, saw as the goal of talking it out. Well, philosophy has always been a form of therapy in that sense. You all know that from nights when your life has felt like it wasn't working and you got together with somebody you liked and you got drunk and you talked about what did it all mean or what does it all mean and you start talking it out. Well, the goal of that is those unreflected parts are to become reflected. The account I'm giving of this mass telecommunication culture, postmodern culture, is that its goal is the opposite, that the I become it, that the parts that were just yours become general property, so that even if you're an idiosyncratic single woman, like the days and nights of Molly Dodd again, which is a nice thing to be, by the time you've watched a few of those, there's not much of you left that isn't it. You can forget about it. It's been understood. It's now part of the general property of everyone. I gave the example earlier. I'll return to it for the fourth time of the telephone sex. It's just an amazing phenomenon to me. First of all, I can't imagine anyone that bored, but in any case, they're your deepest fantasies, which Freud was going to draw out in an analytic framework. No, you just... That's the way that something that was going to be I, you know, that special thing, no matter how perverse. See, remember Freud, when something becomes reflected in Freud's picture, I don't, I mean, you may not know this, but even if it's sick, you're supposed to remember it and it's supposed to become part of the part of you that you know. So you dig up even really ugly memories so that you can know them and know them about yourself. May not be, it may not be pleasant, in fact, it isn't. But then again, that's part of the pleasure principle of mass culture, is it does just the opposite. It takes socially uncomfortable memories and takes them out of that clear garrison and throws them into the wasteland around the city. In the way that elements of the culture of the late 60s broke everyone's heart because families were divided, the country was divided. No one knew what kind of culture we should have after that or during that. No one knew who the heroes were, whether it was the boys that were forced to fight, the grunts down there, or Quaker pacifists who froze in jails in this city. No one had the guts to choose or the way to choose. So our culture since then has been not just about the 60s, but other great revolutionary moments, as I'm not afraid to say, is it in the process continually of burying and reburying them, making them part of the it, scattered out all around. I can go further back based on my father's memories. Great moments of rebellion like the populist movement around the turn of the century, the Knights of Labor and so on. It's the goal of a mass culture to bury that. It's a goal of mass culture to take, take that part of a culture where we've begun to reflect and understand and reverse it and make it unconscious. So that's the reason the, the discourse of Freud is important. It's because the parts of our culture that we understand and can reflect on are just those tiny garrisons. Around it, the mass of the culture, and one can think in our, in our situation, of the tons of information, for example, this city probably has, this city we're in, you know, 10 billion tons of paper on which are printed billions and billions and billions of words. Perfectly analogous to Freud's unconscious. No one's going to dig most of them up. Most of them have no meaning to anyone. The goal of mass culture is to make sure that the narratives of our lives fit somewhere in those documents. Just as fileable, malleable, trainable as possible. 
So out uh, during uh, my uh, break of the lecture, I had another movie suggested to me that raises the possibility in another way, and again, a way if that would have bothered Freud, because for Freud, uh, similar with, uh, with Proust, I don't know if any of you read long books like Remembrance of Things Past, but uh, to the extent you remember the past, you again expand the room of the eye, the garrison, the little clearer part of your head, dig it up from its buried past. Uh, so that's, that's the process working in the direction of enlightenment, which it, which it can. It can work in that direction. But uh, my argument has been that uh, it is endangered in ways that we couldn't suspect. The movie I have in mind here is Total Recall. In Total Recall, the character thinks throughout that he's a revolutionary hero, and it all seems to be taking place in the conscious, clear garrison of the mind, the I, the conscious, clear place. Uh, as many of you have seen Total Recall know, however, the uh, dream type that he's on, which gives him real memories and avoids all... By the way, let me say, don't be too cynical about, about this. In Total Recall, it is true that the people that sold him the vacation are telling the truth about vacations. Vacations are a pain in the behind. There are a lot of trouble, and why not just come back after a few hours with all the right memories, but with no bug bites and, you know, no flat tires, and then go on. So th it's a good product. That's the dialectic of the situation. It's, it's also a good product. But uh, after he's fought this great battle, and you've, the whole movie has taken place in this clear spot, right? It looks like an action movie. You notice that the dream vacation he ended up buying was called Blue Sky Over Mars, which is how the movie ends with these blue skies over Mars. And you realize, well, you know, with memories like that, now he's a revolutionary hero. And it's conscious. See, it looks conscious. So the duplicity that Freud located in consciousness recurs in culture in an even more savage way. Because even in the most private parts of the eye, where we think we're clearest, in principle, we can't be sure that they're not already invaded, enculturated, stamped, coded, filed, indexed. Not in a direct, crude way like in Total Recall, because television is already more subtle than that. Uh, again, from my generational perspective, things may look different, but, uh, you know, I'll have to use it. I, you, know, well, you can... Use yours when you want to. We can talk later. But from my generational perspective, it's been a, a very bizarre experience to see your earlier life recreated as a kind of drama of a period in which you quasi-recognize yourself but realize they've invaded everything that meant anything to you and taken it over as a game like Trivial Pursuit. You know? It's like, like, you know, sitting in the nice cafe and hearing... Uh, a Doors album on Muzak. And some very important part of what made you who you are now has become unreflective to you. You get where you don't even listen. In fact, listening is maybe where I'll want to stop since I've talked so much.